Blog Talk Radio. Uh, we are on the air with the V spot. Uh, they all forgot to turn off the giraffe intro. I thought they did. All right, I'm Dr. Vic Tater. I'm going to be talking to Jerry Conway very soon when he calls in. Uh, so, Neil, how are things going with you at the moment? I haven't been feeling well. All right. Uh, Jerry Conway, like we talked to him back in December about his Marvel work. He had runs on Amazing Spider-Man, almost every book that Marvel had in the 70s except X-Men, which uh, I think came back after he had left. But he went on to DC Comics where he created Firestorm, which I can tell you right now is a great comic with a unique concept, and no one has really been able to get it right since Jerry Conway left the book back in the 80s. Uh, he also had a very long run on Justice League of America. Uh, from, like, the late 70s till the post-crisis, among other things. Uh, he had a run on Batman. Uh, okay, here he is right now. Uh, is this Jerry? Yes, it is. All right. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us again. I'm, uh, between both of our reschedulings, I didn't think it was going to happen again. <laughs> well, we managed. All right. Uh, well, as I was telling my audience, uh, uh, we left off last time where you were when you were working at Marvel. Yes. All right, and you moved on to DC, and the DC conversation will fit in nicely with the projects you have right now. Uh, can you tell us a bit about it? Uh, well, where would you like me to start? Uh, what? Uh, uh, you can just start it. You can just start at the beginning. I know it involved a character of yours appearing on the show Arrow, and you had not been informed of it ahead of time. Yeah, actually, well, here's the here's the situation. DC is a is a very responsive company in a lot of ways. Uh, they offer a uh, uh, a deal where creators uh, and co-creators and characters can participate in the. Uh, uh, financial rewards of having created a character. Uh, they get a, a percentage, you know, of, of uh, what DC gets for uh, the use of the character in a, sh- in a television show or a toy or a video game or so on. Uh, the, the only hitch uh, is that DC does not itself uh, police this. In, in other words, they don't look over the characters that are being used and say, oh, this character was created by Jerry Conway, so let's contact uh, Jerry and let him know that uh, we're using the character. Uh, the writers and artists themselves uh, are asked to, uh, to keep track of this. The only pr- now, th- that's not a problem in, in the sense uh, of people who are working for DC currently, you know, if you're, if you're working on a story uh, for, for DC uh, and you create a new character, it's kind of automatic that the editor says, okay, well, let's file the paperwork and make sure that you uh, get, get uh, uh, this character uh, uh, in the equity participation program. But if you worked for the, for the company, as I did, like 30 years ago, uh, and you're not really part of the loop anymore, there is no system set up at DC uh, to track that. Uh, so the only way I found out uh, recently that uh, a character I'd created for Firestorm uh, named Felicity Smoke was uh, being used on uh, the TV show Arrow was when uh, some, some fans of mine uh, who followed my Twitter feed happened to mention, oh, you know, what, what do you think of a whiskey smoke appearing an arrow? And I was like, well, I didn't know that she was appearing an arrow. Uh, and honestly, I probably, even if I, I mean, I was watching the show, but I, it just never connected for me because, you know, I've written something like a thousand comic book stories over the years. Right. And, and I really don't remember all of them. So it was not... Uh, not something that uh, that immediately popped into my head. Oh, this is a character that I created. I mean, what are the and odds? Also, right? 
And it might be also, you know, that it's kind of strange that, you know, it would be a non-superhero character popping up in an unrelated show. Yeah, it was, it was a, it was a kind of, I mean, it was not something that you would just automatically expect. I, I understand ha- how it would come about from the, uh, the point of view of the, the writers uh, on, uh, on Arrow, because, you know, they're looking at the DC uh, character uh, list and, and maybe they, they need a, as they did, they needed a character with expertise in uh, computer science. And uh, Felicity had a, had a, has a terrific name. So, you know, it's the kind of name that you'd want to use for a character. And, and uh, I'm sure it just seemed like a perfectly natural pickup for them. And I don't think there are any villains in this. I mean, I'm not criticizing DC at all for, for doing this. And, in fact, they've been very responsive. You know, and when I, when I contacted them, they gave me the, uh, uh, the paperwork for the equity. And I'll, I'll be reimbursed. So it's, it's all good. The, the, the difficulty, from my point of view, is uh, that in the past, when uh, uh, there was a different management at DC, uh, so, and, and, and by the way, again, this is not a criticism at all of DC. It's just a different way that they were doing it. Uh, in the past, they were more proactive. They were, they were more yeah. uh, likely to, uh, uh, to jump on this from their end. So I guess I, I, I sort of took it for granted that that was the way things were always going to be, and that's my bad. You know, it's like well, I, I'm. I've heard from a few particular people, you know, just reading around the internet that ever since Paul Levitz left, or is it Levitz? I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. Levitz. 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 Okay. Ever since yeah. Paul Levitz left, that DC has gotten a lot sloppier as far as when it comes to uh, paying creators royalties. Or it feels like the, they're kind of just doing whatever they're legally required to do, but they're not going to do anything more. Well, Paul, I mean, it, it, Paul, Paul is kind of a special case for, at DC because he's a uh, he was someone who who started out uh, when DC was was very unresponsive to creators. I mean, uh, Paul came in as a as my assistant, actually, my assistant and uh, Joe Orlando's assistant uh, back in the uh, mid-'70s when he was like a kid. You know, he was like 17, 18 years old, and, and it was kind of a summer job for him. Uh, and he came, he came in, and he was uh, working for us part-time, um, and he saw how the, how the creators were treated, uh, which was very, very poorly. I mean, this was before any efforts were made uh, to – uh, to, to give creators participation at all in uh, in their characters, and DC was the first company to really offer that. And I think Paul, uh, while he was not uh, the person who started that, uh, I think he felt a kind of a, a, a real connection to it and a proprietary uh, involvement in it because he came up through the ranks at DC as that was moving forward. So. He, he was invested in it in a way that the guys who are currently there really aren't. And, it's, and again, it's not their fault. It's, it's that, uh, you know, DC is a business. It's a, it's a company that, uh, that, that has a limited amount of money available to do things. And uh, it just happened that the guy who was in charge of the company as, as the uh, uh, publisher for many years was someone who was fanatical about keeping track of this. So he was, you know, we, we, it was a special case scenario. I mean, it was not that what Paul was doing was how businesses should operate. I mean, I think it is. Honestly, I think that's how businesses yeah. should operate. But, you know, realistically, it's not how businesses do operate. Uh, and with Paul's uh, 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 leaving the company, there hasn't been anybody who felt it was their uh, their obligation to go that extra step, uh, and, it, and, it, and it isn't anybody's obligation. It would be really nice if DC did that, and it would be really nice if Marvel did that. Uh, but you know, we live in the world in which people have to fight for their health care, so <laughs> you know, it's not like <laughs> it's, it's not like doing anything. You. Yes, it's it's not like. Uh, that DC is doing anything that any other business isn't doing. And, and to be really, really, really fair to them, they are very responsive to the creators when the creators do ask for this. So uh, I, I don't mean to give anybody an impression that DC is, is trying to 
uh, uh, avoid, you know, uh, helping out. It's just that they have, you know, a whole laundry list of, of, of concerns that they have to deal with, and making sure that a guy who created a character 30 years ago gets reimbursed is not one of them. <laughs> so. uh, I wanted to ask you about this now, because it's interesting it was a Firestorm character, because Firestorm is probably your most famous creation. And, you know, Firestorm was probably was a character that, you know, had a really <laughs> big... I mean, Firestorm was a big part of the final seasons of Super Friends. Uh, yeah. So I am curious because, you know, I've been reading these because before I have a guest on the show, a writer or artist, or, or, I try to do as much research as I can, so I've been reading your work on Firestorm and Justice League. Sure. Uh, how how did you create Fire? How did you and Al Milgram create Firestorm? Well, Firestorm was, was my effort to, to, to create a character for DC that would be as much fun as I felt Spider-Man was for Marvel. Uh, he's a, he, he was a teenage superhero, uh, and he had a, had a kind of a, uh, uh, a happy-go-lucky, wisecracking personality. Uh, but I, I also wanted to do something that would make him different and unique. Um, so there was this notion I had, this, this feeling I had that, that the the traditional superhero uh, up till that time, uh, uh, it, as opposed to the traditional anti-superhero, let me put it that way, because the traditional superhero was like Superman, you know, uh, or, or Batman, you know, a, a clean cut, uh, brilliant guy who had no problems, you know, and then the Marvel version of that was the alienated hero, the, the, the uh, guy who was still very bright, uh, but kind of uh, an outcast as a result right. of uh, being, being just a little bit sharper than everybody else, you know, right? So I thought, well, well let's, let's sort of spin this a little bit and let's, let's make him actually kind of the popular guy. Uh, you know, let's make uh, the, the, the thought I had in my head is what if what if it had been Flash Thompson who got bit by the spider rather than Peter Parker? Yeah, <laughs> and, that's what I was know, thinking like, when I was reading it. Exactly. You know, it's like this, this is the, this is the, the the jock. You know, this is the guy who's uh, uh, basically the popular kid in school, but he doesn't have the one thing that he wants, which is the brainy girl. You know, he wants he wants the girl to like him that would otherwise like Peter Parker. So he does something incredibly stupid and gets his superpowers as a result. You know, because it's, it's always the guys who, who are doing the heroic thing, you know, who get the superpowers, or the guy who's in the wrong place at the wrong time. I just wanted to upend a lot of those conventions. And at the same yeah. time, I wanted, I wanted to do something that... that um, when, when superheroes think to themselves, you know, we all have this thing that the ego, the super ego, you know, the, the voice in our head that tells us, maybe you shouldn't try that. You know, maybe you shouldn't do that. Uh, the voice of wisdom, right, <laughs> that we usually end up ignoring. Um, well, I thought it would be kind of fun to actually make that a person and to make that the older person that, that's always telling you, don't do that stupid thing you're going to do. And I thought that would be kind of fun if it's, you know, the, the wise guy is literally a wise guy. Um, so I tried to combine those various elements, and I think it, I think it worked out in a kind of iconic way. Yeah, uh, it really you know, did. So, yeah, I was very happy with the way Firestorm turned out. Uh, and, and, and obviously he's one of, the, one of the main characters from that period that was, uh, that I, that, that, uh, was developed that's actually still around, you know, what, 35, 40 years later. You know, I found the professor interesting that, like you were talking about using Flash Thompson or, you know, a jock type. And when I see the professor, if you didn't know better, he always seems like the villain in a Spider-Man comic before they got uh, mutated or something. <laughs> yeah. He sort of has a, a, a Frederick Boswell look, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it, it's very... where Harry, he looks kind of like Harry Osborn with glasses. Uh, not Harry Osborn, uh, Norman Osborn with glasses. Um, uh, yeah. Let me ask you something about Cliff, uh, and I can't remember uh, Cliff Carmichael. How did Cliff make yeah. it 16 years old without being stabbed? <laughs> he really is a dick, isn't he? <laughs> like, I know, and I like this issue when he's trying to 
trying to get people to help him, and everybody hates him. <laughs> and yeah. he kept going from one person to another, and they each had a valid reason for not liking him, and I thought that was a nice. And you don't see that really a lot of times because in comics, you know, and fans, you know, and I mean, I'm in this lump as well, you know, you'll rarely see a nerd being hateful. Yeah. And as well, we know, want, we know a lot. Yeah, uh, no, I, I guess I just wanted to turn it all on its head, you know. I really did. Because <laughs> uh, ordinarily, you know, I, I'm, I'm more of a Cliff Carmichael than a, than a, than a Ronnie Raymond. I mean, it, it, it was really a stretch for me to be writing, uh, you know, the nerd as the, 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 the jerk in the piece, you know, because <laughs> I, I, my sympathies are with the nerd. Uh, but I thought, you know, for Turn it around, you know, and and these guys can be kind of kind of mean. I mean, you know, if you're the uh, if you're the not very bright kid, or the or they're just the average kid, the C grade student, you know, uh, which is what Ronnie was. Uh, these guys can be kind of mean to you, you know. <laughs> it's like, um, I, I I did have experiences in high school because I was, you know, I was the the A, a student, the the uh, the nerd, uh, the outcast. And I, I did actually end up making friends with uh, my equivalent of a Ronnie Raymond. And what I found was that Ron, the, my, the, the guy who I, I sort of based Ronnie on was a really sweet guy uh, who I was terrified of, which made me a bit of a jerk towards him. Uh, and, and at the same time, he felt kind of like I was, uh, you know, uh, somebody who he was intimidated by because I was the guy who kind of knew things that he didn't know. So we both had stuff to learn from each other, which I think is always, you know, useful to, for anybody to recognize that uh, in, in the people that they meet. Uh, anyway, I was, I, it was a good experience for you. Yeah, it's interesting, though, because it turns so many things on their head, you know, and I always find when you go to school, you know, it's not quite like TV makes it up. Have you ever seen, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the episode of The Simpsons where Homer goes to college and he's watching this TV show to prepare him, and he sees a nerd walk by yeah. and he goes, nerd, and he looks at his jock, hey, buddy, did you get a lot of that nerd? The jock says, I beg your pardon, sir? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And well, that's, that's yeah. I think it's important, yeah. It's you know, really important not to. You know, uh, ahead, sorry, but I noticed. Sorry. No, that's all right. I apologize, but you know, one thing I noticed is because following you on Twitter, I know how liberal you are. Yeah. You know, and it's yeah. funny how you would do a lot of jokes and firestorm that if you didn't know better, you would think you were a Republican because, like, you know, the liberal judge, like Killer Frost, free. Right. Well, I, I did have a period in my in my uh, uh, late twenties, early thirties when I when I was more uh, leaning towards towards uh, conservatism than than, than liberalism. Um, but then I grew up. No. <laughs> uh, you know, I think there's a period where, where where I guess my rebellion was against my my liberal uh, instincts. Uh, but yeah, you know, I mean, I'm willing to see the, the, the same side. I mean, I'm willing, like with with understanding uh, Ronnie Raymond, I, I do try to see this, the, both sides of an issue. My issue uh, as a liberal with with the conservatives who are around today is that I don't think they're really conservatives. Uh, the people that that I respected uh, as a conservative or conservative leaning. Uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, today would be considered uh, liberals by yeah, the, the yeah. you know, uh, Ronald Reagan could not get the Republican nomination today. Yeah, no, uh, Eisenhower, <laughs> Eisenhower would be lynched. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, Eisenhower, I mean, what we have to recognize is that the people who are running the, the Republican Party now are far-right radical uh, uh, uh Far, far, far right radicals. Uh, they make Barry Goldwater look, you know, like a like a like a moderate, and uh, it's a real shame because America needs uh, a, a a an honest dialogue between political parties that are that are uh, representative of coherent, you know, uh, political philosophies. 
And we don't have that right now. We have uh, basically the Democratic Party, uh, which isn't really as progressive as I'd like it to be. It's, it's more center, uh, center left than, than progressive. And we have the Republican Party, which is like just to the other side of John Birch society as far as I'm concerned. I mean, yeah, well, you know, I always, planet. yeah, I was telling somebody, I said, we don't really need a third party. We need a second one. Yeah, we really do. I mean, we need a, we, look, I grew up, I grew up in New York uh, in uh, the 50s and 60s with, with Republican governors and senators and a, a, a mayor of New York who were all Republicans and they were all much more liberal than Barack, Barack Obama. So it's like really weird for me to hear Republicans today criticizing Obama as a communist. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? The guy is, is further right than Jacob Javits was, you know, and further right than, than Nelson Rockefeller and further right than uh, John Lindsay. You know, and these are, these are people that I, I grew up, uh, you know, as, as, as Republican governors, I mean, it's, it's like, what the heck are they talking about anymore? <laughs> I don't even know. Um, so it's, it's just bizarre for me. I mean, Richard Nixon today would be considered a liberal. Uh, so yeah, I, I just it's, it's crazy. It's just crazy. Uh, uh, so anyway, but, get, but, but we don't want to talk uh, about politics on your podcast. <laughs> Uh, let me ask you, the other thing you were doing at D.C. that I think your big run would have been Justice League. Uh, now, was uh-huh. writing Justice League intimidating? Well, let's see. I would say that, that uh, nothing intimidated me when I was, when I was in my 20s. <laughs> I, I had a tremendous self-confidence. Uh, but at the same time, it was, it was a, uh, a real challenge to do well. Um, I, I don't know if I did it well, but I but I, I did it for a long time, and uh, it was a uh, uh, it was a lot of fun and, and and it was challenging to come up with stories that would that would provide real uh, real scope for those characters to operate in. All right. Now, eventually, uh, Firestorm had an interesting journey because first he had his own book, and that got canceled in the uh, what was it the the implosion the implosion, the implosion. That was can- right in right. five issues. Then he went over to Flash, and I'm curious about this on Flash because you had uh, George Perez drawing the backup strip, and then Jim Starlin. How did they? How were you able to get such a or DC able to get such big names on a backup strip in Flash? Well, I think for uh, for two reasons. I mean, one was they, they really wanted to draw the character because he he was one of the more fun characters to draw for an artist at at uh, at DC at the time. And two, there was a uh, it, it was a it was a sh- small commitment for these guys. Uh, the other thing that happened, I mean, DC w- was. Um, they were offering contracts for people to produce a certain amount of, of, of material a month. But because of the page counts that we had, it was not possible for them to, let's say, let's say an artist wanted to do 30 pages a month, right? Uh, the only way that you could get them to do 30 pages a month was by giving them a 22-page story and an eight-page backup. Right or or some combination there 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 right they're, something like that so so you you didn't have any bi monthly books and you didn't have uh, enough material for them to uh, uh, to do just by by doing just one book you know one book alone wouldn't have been enough so they had to have uh, either you know they had to work on on uh, the, the long form books, you know, like a, like a uh, like a sixty four page book, let's say, where they had to do a, a main feature and a backup feature. And I was just fortunate that uh, you know I had had a backup feature that was attractive for these guys to do. Uh, now on uh, uh, just Slager, yeah, that's what. It, uh, when you were going to have Firestorm join, or you had a new member join the team, because Justice League didn't. It, it was Justice League is uh, people don't still don't seem to get this, but JLA is not really the Avengers. You know, they don't really have a rotating cast. 
No. Uh, would you have to? How did you have to go to a lot of trouble to get new members at like Satana or Firestorm? No, actually, uh, I mean, there would be trouble in the sense of, uh, of it, it would be I'd have to convince my editor uh, <laughs> you know, that I wanted to do it. But uh, from a from a practical point of view, the characters that I brought in were, were usually orphan characters uh, who didn't have a, a, a series of their own or uh, were being underutilized, you know, in some other way. So. It was an opportunity for me to uh, to work with characters who were not overly committed elsewhere. So that's that was most most of the time the editors were happy to let me do that. Uh, and and I also as a fanboy I wanted there were certain characters I wanted to work with you know like Zatanna I, I really wanted I thought she'd be really useful for me as a uh, as a writer to have a, a, a another female character in the book that I could uh, could use. And also a character that had some major powers that would help balance out, uh, uh, you know, characters like Superman or, or Green Lantern. Uh, now, about Superman, uh, in Justice League Season 1, I remember on one of the DVD commentaries, they mentioned that it was very difficult to work Superman in stories because they said either you have a villain beat Superman to prove how strong he is, which gets because eventually it gets old after a while, you know, or you have him... Uh, yeah, but how do you deal with that? So having someone so powerful that in that he could reasonably defeat almost any enemy that can defeat the Justice League. <laughs> it is a problem, isn't it? I mean, it's it's. Uh, I think what I think what you do there's there's certain conventions that you that that became more difficult to follow as as uh, fans became more savvy. Uh, you know. I, I was writing the Justice League during a period of transition from the period when when readers were kind of willing to accept a suspension of disbelief and say, yeah, that could happen, to a period where fans had more more say and were much more critical of uh, whether something was likely or not, right? You know, it would be like, well, that could never happen. Uh, so kind of we had to, yeah. I mean, before, before in the early part of my run, we, we would just sort of like say, and Superman, you know, gets gets knocked out by a green kryptonite blow, and we just sort of dealt with it, you know, we just sort of uh, locked him away for for a bit. Uh, but then after a while, you have to start becoming more creative, or you have to write him out of out of the story. Uh, it was a big problem. Superman still is a big problem for for uh, for writers because he's he is so powerful, even even with the diminished powers that he has today, uh, he still is a major obstacle to overcome, and more so because our willingness to suspend disbelief is uh, uh, is much more rigorous. You know, it's like we're 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 not as easily sidestepped <laughs> you know, as readers. Uh, which is a, which is both good and bad, you know. It's like it's going to be interesting to see how how uh, Warner Brothers handles, you know, a Superman Batman movie, uh, which is what they're preparing to do next. Because the, the disparity between the, the, the capabilities of those char- two characters is so vast that it becomes ludicrous. I mean, just look at the end of Man of Steel, right? With with Superman. Uh, blasting Metropolis, Superman and, and uh, Zod blasting Metropolis into rubble, and ask yourself, how long would Batman have lasted in the middle of that? <laughs> well, you know, I have this joke I like to tell, and it's always like, who would win to fight Superman or Batman? And the answer is always Superman, you idiot. Yeah, right. It's like, uh, how? No, is Superman's not a nice guy. You know, no, yeah, right. Superman's just not nice no guy. You know, yeah. Right, if he wanted to, he'd just go into outer space and pop his head like a pimple. Yeah, there is no fight. Uh, I mean, look at look at the 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 uh, the end of uh, of uh, the Dark Knight Rises, and all of the machinations that you had to go through to create a scenario in which Batman, uh, you know, is in serious danger. You know, it's like 
he's and he's the toughest guy in Gotham City, right? And and you have to go through all this stuff to create this problem. Well, super, that that problem doesn't exist for Superman. He picks up the bomb and he throws it into space. Story's over, right? <laughs> There's no story. Yeah, I think it's over. Right? Like now, would you say that action. for Silver? Well, would you say that in some ways, like for Silver Age Superman, do you think that that may have helped keep the stories more creative? Well, they they they, they were different. They were more fairy tales than than really stories. Uh, and and the hoops that that they had to jump through to make the stories interesting were were pretty pretty severe. I mean, you know, they, the the number of imaginary stories, the number of red kryptonite stories, the number of gimmick stories. You know, there 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 are, there are quite a few. Once once you start trying to create Superman stories in quote the real world, things become very difficult. Um, yeah. And that's where I think the Superman Batman movie is going to be really hard to to, to make credible. Uh, so it's going to be it's going to be an interesting story. Uh, you know, people are saying, well, if it's going to be based on the the Dark Knight Returns, that'll be really cool. No, well, because the Dark Knight Returns was something that could never actually happen. You know, I mean, yeah, there's it, literally no way that Batman could be a challenge to Superman. None. <laughs> right, and a lot of it, well, the main challenge that Batman is to Superman is that Superman has a uh, built-in morality. Like the same way if you're play wrestling with three-year-olds, you're not going to go all out on them. Right, except that we know that, that as of Man of Steel, Superman doesn't have that built-in morality anymore. So right. it's like Batman, Superman will kill you if you're jeopardizing four people in a subway. That's basically it. <laughs> so... So there is no morality issue for Superman anymore, which does kind of make it difficult for us to see how anybody is a jeopardy uh, against him. You know, uh, the, the deal with Superman was always that if you put him in a moral quandary, uh, that kind of was a checkmate move for him. But as we saw at the end of Man of Steel, no, he'll just kill you. <laughs> so it's like, I don't really know what how, how you deal with Superman anymore. Uh, so it's kind of a tough tough call. I, I, I would not want to be Batman if Batman decided that uh, he had to stop Superman. Uh, uh, if, I can get, if I can get back to Firestorm, when Firestorm came back as a regular sure. book, there were a lot of, cl- uh, of cliff, uh, cliffhangers and you know plot points left over in issue five of his last mm-hmm. series. And some of those were dealt with in Flash. Now, when the series came back, did you have any ideals for the original series that you might have changed your mind on? Uh, well, it was several years later, so I had, I had changed as a writer, and I was working with a different artist. Um, and all of that influences you, you know. So I don't think I felt like I could pick up right away from where I'd left off and that there were things that I, I, I needed to deal with uh, you know that I didn't. I didn't have an opportunity. I mean, some some of them I did pick up, as I as you say, in the Flash stories. Uh, some of them I picked up in the the Superman team up story. And I mean, there were different ways for me to sort of uh, uh, fill those things out. But I tried to approach Fury of Firestorm as a as if it were a new title that that didn't have a. Uh, a full backlog of, of stories that had to be uh, addressed. You know, I mean, I, I, I addressed them to yeah. the degree that I could, but I didn't feel like I I, I wanted to sort of start from scratch uh, without yeah, actually I, starting from scratch. You know, I thought you did a very good job of that. Where there'd be enough for the old readers that came over, but for a new reader, they came into a basically a fresh book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's always a tough call because. You know, you, you don't want to uh, you, you don't want to alienate or ignore what went before, but at the same time, you know, you have to recognize that you're you're dealing with a new readership. It's uh, it's a toughie, but uh, fortunately, I was working with a fabulous artist who made Firestorm seem brand new. You know, I mean, Pat Broderick did a terrific job uh, making that that character seem like a whole new ball game. Uh, so all good. It was all good. <laughs> I was very lucky. 
when did you have the ideal for uh, Firehawk? Uh, well, fairly early on, I knew that I wanted to have a female uh, superhero. Superhero, and I, I love writing powerful females. You know, I mean, half of the characters that I've created uh, uh, that have any any legs to them are female characters. Um, and I just like I just had this. I, I love the idea that that. You know, the flaming hair was such a big deal for me for for Firestorm that the idea of a a female with a flaming hair was irresistible. Uh, But I didn't want her to be exactly like Firestorm. So, um, you know, going to the to the to the uh, to the bird motif seemed like a a fun thing to do. Um, Also, one of my favorite female characters was always Hawkgirl. So, you know, this is a way to, 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 to combine Firestorm and uh, and Hawkman, you know, and create this flaming I hawk. Like, you know, so. I like the idea that uh, every time they redid, the, like they were trying to simulate the accident, it created a brand new character uh, or brand new powers. Like it was so such a random deal. It wasn't like somebody yeah. would get a radioactive rock say, you, you, you. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, when you think about it, that's that's pretty much how how it should be, isn't it? I mean, uh, it, these are unique events, uh, you know. And, and every time a, a spider bites you, it shouldn't turn you into Spider Man. Sometimes it should kill you. <laughs> and every time, you know, uh, something like this happens with, uh, especially with with an, an atomic event, you know, it's it's got to be brand new. So. Uh, I mean, that's how we got, I think, Multiplex. That's how we got Multiplex. So, right, you know, he was just in the accident, the initial one. Yeah. So it's all it's, it's all part of that. Uh, let me, uh, going in further about Firestorm, because uh, we think we got about ten minutes left. <laughs> I need to find a new service. But uh, I mean, Fire, one thing I noticed about Firestorm is after you left the book, uh, it seemed like no other writer, and I mean, lot, uh, good writers have tackled Firestorm, but it seemed like no one could ever get the character right again. Like the con- like they seem to have abandoned the like the first thing seemed to be abandoned was the whole fusion concept of two men yeah. merged. And it, it, why do you think that is? That nobody can quite figure the character out. I honestly, I honestly don't know because it's it's such a simple, basic, iconic concept that it should be it should be a no brainer. But for for whatever reason, I, I guess writers are always we're always looking to make things our own, right? You know, and we always think that uh, that our take on things uh, uh, it can, can improve it. But to my mind, you know, Firestorm was a, was a successful book when I was writing it. Uh, I, I left the book for personal reasons. Not I was not like fired because the sales were slumping. The sales were great. Uh, so there was really nothing ro- nothing broken, <laughs> you know. It was it was working great, and I've never gotten why the people why the the different iterations since then have refused to go back to that working formula. Uh, it it was fine, you know. I mean, you know, it was. It, it, I I I understand that 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 somebody as a writer might come on a book and, and not really be interested in, in uh, writing the character as, as it was created. But I would sort of wonder why an editor would be okay with that. You know, it's like, or, or I, I would also wonder why an editor would want to take a book that's doing well or a character that's been successful and, and change it. Uh, if the character hadn't been doing well, then I could see changing it. But if you, if you have something that's working, why quote fix it? You know, it's like when they brought back Firestorm this this, this last time, I really thought that they had the opportunity to, uh, you know, to go back. To, they were basically given the opportunity because it was the new Fifty Two to go back to square one and and repair all the the damage, you know, and just make it Ronnie and and Professor Stein and and uh, go from there. Instead, they went into this very dark, weird, uh, bleak sort of character storyline that really has nothing to do with the the the, the 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 energy of that character. 
Firestorm is a fundamentally silly character. And, I, and I, when I say silly, I'm not saying it as a value judgment because it's not meant as a value judgment. It's actually, a, it's actually in my view, one of the, uh, the inherent virtues of a character. There aren't yeah, enough silly character. characters. Yeah. It, there, uh, Spider-Man, in, in his best moments, is a silly character. And by, by that I mean he embraces the joy of, of the dumbness of comics. I mean, comics are, are a wonderful, well, wonderfully dumb format. And, and by dumb, I, I, it's not a, it's, again, you know, when I use that word, it's a, it's a value-charged word, and people say, oh, you know, you're, you're saying comics are dumb. Well, I don't mean dumb in the sense of stupid. I mean dumb in the sense of fun. <laughs> it's like dumb fun, I think, you know? It's, well, it's like I think fun. the problem is a lot of people are – I think some people are embarrassed of comics, you know? Like they don't – so to overcompensate, they'll take things and just make them as dark and bleak and just try to suck all the fun out of it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I don't get it because here you've got a character whose basic, basic look is silly. His hair is on fire, for God's sake. <laughs> so this is, by its very nature, a silly thing. And then on top of that, his powers are silly. You know, I mean, or at least the way they were silly the way I, I was doing them, which was, you know, he can change the atomic structure of things so that, you know, he makes things from, from one thing into another. And, you know, sometimes it's kind of dumb. You know, it's kind of silly. Especially since he was a kid who was acting from a uh, from an adolescent point of view, you know, he was he, he was thinking like a kid, and that to me was was a lot of charm. There was a lot of charm for that. Uh, but over the years, you know, I mean, it's one thing to pile crap on a kid, which I was perfectly willing to do. I was always willing to give him a lot of crap in his life. You know, that was part of part of uh, your job as a writer is to put your characters through hell. You know? But their, their fundamental self has to be full, uh, you, you has to be true to themselves. And Ronnie Raymond's fundamental self was irreverent and funny and, and, and silly. Uh, and that's why the dynamic between him and Professor Stein worked, I think, particularly well, because Professor Stein was this kind of stern, Stein, Stern, you know, that's sort of the the, uh, yeah, buddy, uh, the the implication there. He's a bit of a fuddy-duddy. He's an older person. You know, he's, he's that reasonable adult in the room. And what makes it funny is that he's completely helpless. You know, he can stand by and, and tell you, you're going to get in a lot of trouble if you do that, but he can't do anything about it. So that's wonderful to me. Uh, and, you know, here's Ronnie Raymond the not brightest, you know, the not brightest bulb in the in the in the in the batch, who has all this tremendous power, and not always the greatest, you know, wisdom in using it. That's a terrific setup for for an iconic uh, 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 character. And for some reason, over the years, for the last thirty five years, the different writers and artists that have come on the book have just absolutely refused to use that. And I don't understand why. And it's never been successful. I mean, it's, it's like if they, had, if they had hit a home run, I would, have, I, I, I would be unable to argue with their choices. But they have never been successful doing it, so I don't know why they keep doing it. Guys, <laughs> could you just go back to square one and do it the way it was done originally for 50-odd issues successfully? <laughs> Do you know how it came? How the TV show and the Super Friends ended up using Firestorm in the final two seasons? Uh, I don't. I, I don't really actually remember the uh, uh, Super Friends very much, so you'll have to tell me. Yeah, they, uh, they no, they just ended up putting it in the cartoon, you know, and they made a big deal out of it in the first season and the second season. I was just wondering, was that a big deal for you to have your character in a TV show? Oh yeah, 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 it was, especially because uh, the deal I had with DC to take it back to the beginning, I was getting a percentage, you know, of the money that DC earned on it. So it was a very big deal for me. <laughs> I did very well with from it financially. And I think it was really good for the character, and I think it was really good for DC. Uh, DC didn't have uh, some, you know, with the exception of Teen Titans, they didn't have a lot of uh, young, hip characters that uh, younger readers could relate to. Uh, 
and they still are struggling with that, you know. So yeah. it would be nice, you know, it would be nice if they sort of went back and brought Firestorm. When you don't go to Geico.com, car insurance can seem intense, like breakup R&B intense. I thought you said you love a sweater that I got you. If you didn't, you could have told me. Geico makes it easy. Just go to Geico.com anytime to update or check your policy without all the extra drama. I even had a gift receipt. Adding the choice of a crispy chicken BLT to Wendy's 4 for 4 is the biggest thing since rappers trying to sing. I got me out and I sound like a robot. But do you like the sound of this? Wendy's 4 for 4 now comes with a choice of a junior bacon cheeseburger or a crispy chicken BLT. From Detroit to Macon, I keep it crisp like bacon. Both are topped with crispy applewood smoked bacon and come with four nuggets, fries, and a Coke for just four bucks. Oh, yeah. At participating Wendy's for a limited time, meal includes small fries and a drink. Not valid in Alaska and Hawaii. 